Three things happened in 2007 that were pretty remarkable, and I think the year 2007 might go down as like the, you know, the, the invention of the Gutenberg Press in that the iPhone was rolled out. The smartphone by Steve Jobs was rolled out, and, and it virtually kind of eliminated boredom. You remember, you remember how that used to be? Um, when, I, when I was pastoring in Alaska, we had a, a number of immigrants that would be from China and from the Philippines. Go Philippines, right? I thought Bill might give me an amen here, but he's still, he still thinking about bacon, I think. From, but, but these uh, immigrants would come, I was, I was amazed that they would be sending money back to their home. Now, that didn't surprise me that they were taking care of their families. But what was interesting is they would, they would have these phone plans that they would pay for also for, for their uh, families back in, in the Philippines. So they, they didn't have running water, but they had a smartphone. Um, I, was, I was just amazed at how that works. But this, the world that we live in has been you know, just inundated with, we just hardly think of anybody. It's hard to find somebody who doesn't have one of these smartphones and who, who doesn't have the notifications going off. Um, and, and there are some people who have them, but don't use them. And I'm not going to pick on Risa or anything. I won't mention her name. But I keep, I keep amazed that, you know, Rob, you, you surely got to teach your mom how to do this. And he just, you know, shrugs his shoulders. He's done the best he can. Um, so the first thing that happened in 2007 was that iPhone being revealed. And, and then secondly, we, the Americans, we saw our attention span decline in half. Uh, commercials have started moving from 30-second spots to 15-second spots. Um, the average attention of a product video is 10 seconds or less. So when you see one of these videos pop up, you know, our attention just is short, short, short. A study from Microsoft uh, found that the average attention span has dipped to a low of 8 seconds, down from 12 seconds in 2000. So a goldfish, they tell me, has an attention span of 9 seconds. So we are less than a goldfish. Wow. So you can see when we have, you know, our announcements and all that sort of thing, it's real easy for us to tune people out. And so I tell Pastor Josh, you got to keep him going, got to keep it going. And even, even when we're doing our, our service online, you know, Colin's got to make sure that it starts on time, that it happens. Because if it's not moving and going, we're losing all the attention of people who are tuned in within eight, 10 seconds, pretty quickly. A third thing that happened, um, which really seemed to, to occur out of nowhere, was this rise of anxiety and mental health issues, not just here in America, but across the globe, and, and especially with teenagers. And, and maybe uh, you remember the days, I remember when, when my parents would take a trip and we would drive somewhere and it would be a long drive. And so my brother and I, we'd sit in the back seat of our Buick LeSabre, and I remember we had a, a property line. My brother had to stay on his side, and I stayed on my side. Because what would happen, we would get bored and start, you know, punching and pulling and picking and carrying on. And so my parents would get annoyed, and they would, knock it off, knock it off. If you don't knock it off, I'm going to knock your heads together. I'd, you know, so back in the day when you could do that sort of thing legally in America... <laughs> You know, I wouldn't recommend doing that today. You know, do it in, in quiet, maybe. Um, but, but our attention span is, has just vanished, ev evaporated. And I remember, you know, on those long rides, just being bored. You know, what are we going to do? And, and I was excited when I was a parent and I had five kids and we threw them in the back of our minivan or our conversion van or, or um, suburban and we could have them all back there and they'd all have their own you know, electronic device that they were messing with and their own music that they were listening to. And, and we even had a, a TV in, in one of the, in the vans that we had, the conversion van, so they could watch, you know, a, a video or something that was going on. We thought this was amazing. This is incredible. But now everybody's got it all, the world at their fingertips through their smartphone, right? Through their device that, that goes off and notifies us and gives us all these notifications of what's going on all the time. Big tech hires people 
to distract us and to addict us to their apps and to their programs and to their devices. And in 2007, the rise of all of these three things, I don't think is a coincidence that we also have this rise of mental health issues and anxiety as well. Um, we're going to talk about the kingdom of noise versus the kingdom of God. According to Time Magazine, more than half of Americans say that the news causes them stress and many report feeling anxiety, fatigue, or sleep loss as a result of watching the news. Yet, one in ten adults checks the news every hour and 20% of Americans report constantly monitoring their social media feeds. So whether we like it or not, we're, we're keeping track of it. Even though it, it annoys us and bothers us and causes us to be anxious, we still turn to it over and over and over and over and over again. We're literally making ourselves anxious by bringing in all of this noise in our hearts and in our life. Well, the scripture that I want us to look at, one of those passages is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul, writing this church, says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice. Put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. That's what we're talking about in this sermon series. We're talking about the, the practice of Jesus, the way of Jesus. Now, Jesus had a lifestyle that he lived that produced the life that we know as Jesus. That, that he had contentment and he had peace and he had joy. And we all want that in our lives. We want contentment and we want peace and we want joy. We want to be able to live by the Spirit and walk in holiness and be, be pleasing to God. We all want that or we wouldn't be here today, right? And, and yet, we see how Jesus demonstrated this life out through his lifestyle. And we struggle to embrace that lifestyle ourselves. In fact, we don't really see the connection in the way that Jesus lived and the practices that he had and the way that the fruit from his life. And what we're calling you to do is, as we saturate ourselves, as we marinate Thinking about barbecue, okay, I won't take too long on this message here. We get off to go get some food, right? But as we're marinating in the Gospels, we're marinating in the life of Jesus, we're thinking about Jesus, I want us to think about some of these practices that Jesus employed in his life, that he adopted in his life, that, that enabled him to live with great peace and contentment and joy. And I think that we can adopt those same practices and habits and we can see the same kind of fruit come from our life as well that's the way paul experienced it and so he told those uh, early christians he said follow me as i follow christ and he says to this church here at uh, philippi he says put it into practice did you see what i'm doing here put it into practice do like i'm doing put this kind of life into practice c.s lewis in his in his book, The Screwtape Letters, he talked about the kingdom of noise, and I mentioned it earlier. The kingdom of noise, of, of how the enemy is trying to distract us and to get us off focus. And it's real easy for that to happen, right? The kingdom of noise is, is taking our attention away from God. The, the kingdom of noise that comes in, and, and we certainly think of all the external noises, right? We think of the traffic going up and down 41 Highway. You think of the nonstop news cycle that we have available to us all the time. The entertainment world, our, our devices that are buzzing in our pockets or in our purses. And you think of all the external noise and, and certainly the, the simple answer is just to turn that stuff off, right? 
easier said than done, but there's also an internal noise that we have to deal with. An internal noise that, that, that we have playing through our heads of the things that we, we want to do, the things that we need to do, the messages that we've heard, the words that somebody spoke to us or the hurts that we're carrying or the bitterness that we're holding on to. So we've got all of this internal noise as well that we've got to eliminate from our lives. And last week we looked at John 15 and Jesus' words when he said, you've got to abide, 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 abide in me. Remain in me, remain in me, abide in me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing, right? You remember that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He didn't say you could do pretty good. He said you could do nothing. And I know we hear those words, but I wonder, do we really believe it? Do we really live our life in such a way that we believe what Jesus is saying is true? That we're going to seek him first and foremost. That we've got to be together with him. That if we're not with him, we're in big trouble. That should, that should stir us and motivate us. I think uh, one of the authors that I like to read, uh, John Mark Comer, he said it pretty well. He said, the noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one impu- input we most need. We fill our lives with all the noise. Psalm 10.4 says, in, in all his thoughts, he has no room for God. And that's a pretty good description of the world that we live in, right? Lots of noise and we don't have time for God. So the problem, I think, is, is less about the noise and, and more about the distraction that it creates and, and how it keeps us from hearing God and being together with God. And so is there a practice of Jesus that would help us move out of this kingdom of noise that we live in, out of this anxiety that we experience, into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of peace and joy and fulfillment? Is there a practice out of the life of Jesus that we can employ, that we can adopt? Is there a practice in his lifestyle that we can put forward? I'm glad you asked that. Silence and solitude is the answer. And it's not the answer that we we like to hear And it's a difficult answer for us. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see how he practiced this and employed this practice over and over and over, that it was a regular part of what he did. So I'm not going to look at all the examples that we find in Scripture because there are so many. And you're going to be reading through the Gospels, so you're going to see them yourselves. But let me just highlight a couple of them. From Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 13 through chapter 4, verse 4, we see the account of Jesus as he is being baptized by his cousin, John the Baptizer. And this incredible event. I mean, do you ever, are you like me, when you, when you read through some of these gospel accounts or even any account in the scriptures, you think, man, I would love to be there. Wouldn't that be an incredible event to be there and to see that happen? So don't get too excited here, folks. Calm down. <laughs> Maybe it's just me that, that, that dreams that way or thinks that way. But, but you see Jesus coming in. He's baptized and the heavens part. And you see the Holy Spirit come down like a dove upon him. And you hear this voice cry out, this is my son. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like to be there, to be a part of that, to see that, experience that? Um, anyway, I think it's a pretty remarkable event. This is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased and then the very next, next thing that happens, after, after God announces, here's my son, here's, the, here's my beloved, here's the one that I've sent for you. The very next thing is Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by a spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What? <laughs> Why would the spirit lead Jesus to go off to the wilderness? I mean, this is his big moment. This is his opportunity to let his name get out there and to see with a big splash, to to set up a GoFundMe page or to print up some business cards and, and start passing those around. Maybe he could write a book. Maybe he could do a tour through Israel. 
But that's not what he does. He goes to the wilderness. The Spirit leads him to go to the wilderness. And that word that we translate wilderness is aremos in the Greek. Everybody say that. Aremos. So, so we are multilingual, right? We can speak English and Greek now. The Aramos. The Aramos can be translated wilderness. It can be translated desert or deserted place or desolate place, solitary place, quiet place, lonely place. And in all four Gospels, we see Jesus going to the Aramos over and over and over again. And this is the first time we find it here in Matthew chapter 4. And for years, I, I kind of read this scripture wrong because I read this scripture in a way that that I saw Jesus being led into the wilderness and, and he had to fast and he had to spend 40 days praying and, and separated and cut off from his, from his friends. And you see, confession time here, I'm, an, I'm more of an extrovert. And, and I like to be with people and I like people and I like engaging in conversation. My wife is not. She's more of an introvert. She's happy to stay at home. She's happy not to have to interact with anybody. And if she spent a day or two or a week, you know, she's perfectly fine with that. That's not a problem. But, but I want to be out and going and moving and talking and being with people and interacting with people. So when I see Jesus secluding himself out in the wilderness for 40 days, I'm thinking, oh, poor Jesus. And then not eating for 40 days. Oh, oh, oh really bad. So I, I read this story and thought, oh, poor Jesus. And here comes that rascally devil. He comes and gets him right in his time of weakness. Right when he's, oh, how could the devil, he, that's just the way he operates, isn't it? He comes and he picks on people who are isolated. He picks on people who are hungry. He picks on the needy. That, that rascally devil, he's, he's terrible. And poor Jesus has to face the devil in his time of weakness. And I think I read that wrong. For all those years, I think that that's the way I was reading it, but I think that was the wrong way to read it. I think we need to understand it as, as Jesus is starting his, his earthly ministry here, God announces who he is and, and how he's well pleased with him, and the Spirit leads him for this time in the wilderness, in the uh, Ramos, to be alone and to be secluded from everybody else so that he could be close to God like never before. So that then he could take on the devil toe-to-toe, face-to-face, nose-to-nose. It was his time of strength. After 40 days in the wilderness, it wasn't a time of weakness. It was a time of strength for, for Jesus to come and, and to deal and do business against the enemy. So the Aramos is not a place of weakness, it's a place of strength. In Mark 1, we have an account of Jesus' first day on the job. Mark records this account where he's, he's healing Peter's mother-in-law. And once this miracle happens, word spreads quickly, right? And all of a sudden, everybody's in the surrounding area. They're bringing all the sick, and they're bringing the demon-possessed. They're bringing all these people here to Jesus, and Jesus is healing him. He's going full steam ahead. Busy, busy, busy day. And Mark 1, verse 35 through 36, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place, the Aramos, where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody is looking for you. Everyone's looking for you. Jesus, what are you doing here? We're, we're, We're getting a big crowd. Word's getting out. This is a great time. Why are, you, why are you going off by yourself? That's the wrong thing to be doing. Jesus, what's the matter with you? Use your head. Common sense says we're, we're, we're moving. Take the momentum and run with it. But Jesus knows that if he's going to be involved in healing and casting out demons and doing all of this ministry, he better spend time in this solitary place with the Father. In the Aramos. And again, I think I, I misread this passage a little bit because I, I think I thought, well, Jesus is tired, exhausted after a busy day, so he's just going to get away and relax. But that's not what it is. I think it's Jesus recognizes, apart from me, you can do nothing. We've got to remain connected to God. And here is Jesus, who is fully God, 
but also fully man. And he's showing us how to live our life. He's showing us the lifestyle that we need to adopt. So if we want the life of Jesus, we've got to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 31, the apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all that they've done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place to the Aramos and get some rest. He doesn't say what we need is a new Sunday school lesson. What we need is a a theological teaching here. Let me get out the theology book and let me start teaching to you some of this. Now believe me, I've got all kinds of theology books. I think theology is vitally important. I think Sunday school lessons, I think this biblical instruction is really important. But Jesus says, you disciples, what you need more than that, the first thing you need is to get alone with God. The disciples need to be with Jesus. They need their quiet time. Luke's gospel, I think there's nine accounts where where Jesus gets alone in the Eremos. In Luke 15, or 5, verse 15 and 16, yet the news about him spread all the once more, and the crowds came to hear him to be healed of their sickness. In verse 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus often withdrew. If people were describing your life, could they say that about you? That Andy often withdraws to the Aramos, to the quiet places to spend time in prayer. This was a regular part of his lifestyle. And if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to have the life of Jesus, we've got to employ the lifestyle of Jesus within us. Silence and solitude is the intentional time in the quiet to be alone with ourselves and God. Keith Drury, he's a a Wesleyan minister, actually lives just south of here. Now he's retired down the Wesleyan village in in Brooksville. He, He writes, silence is abstaining from the sound in order to open our spiritual ears and listen more closely to the voice of God. And God seldom speaks loudly. Silence is like a hearing aid. It helps us magnify the voice of God. And the noisier our lives are, the harder it is to hear from God. And it's so easy for us to just fill our lives up with noise, right? But the discipline of silence helps us escape the tyranny of noise and and recalibrate our souls to the stillness and the quietness of God and God's voice. And the voice of God is usually a silent one. He's not screaming and hollering and yelling. I like to take, um, when we had our dog, I would take the dog for a walk in the morning and a walk for in the evening. And now I'm realizing I've got to do more exercise and I need to be riding my bike. And so I, when I get out and try to ride my bike, one of the things I do is I grab my phone and I get earphones so I can listen to a podcast or music or sermon, or lecture, or TED Talk, or something. And so I'm, I'm considering myself productive as I'm walking and moving and, and listening and learning, listen to an audio book or something. So I, I don't want any wasted time and wasted space, I think. But there's times I just leave my phone behind, or I've grabbed my phone and forgotten my headphones, and so then I can't really listen to anything But, you know, I I realize that that can be a good thing, too, when I'm walking along in the silence, not filling my head with noise, but just taking the time as I'm riding a bike, as I'm walking to, to just be with God. And sometimes I hear God speak, and sometimes it's just silence. And there's a healing that comes. But that's not easy. For somebody who's a type A personality, somebody who wants to go and move and get things accomplished, it requires an intentional plan, right? A desire. It doesn't happen by accident. The reality is when I'm always talking, when I'm always listening to something, listening to others, it's not easy to listen to God. And I want to find myself listening to God and His voice and His presence more often 
than I am. As a general rule, the more we talk, the more we sin. Amen? Proverbs 10, 19, too much talk leads to sin, but be sensible and keep your mouth shut. This is difficult for us, not just the external noise that we hear, but, but it's difficult for us because we want to talk. We want to interject. We want to hear our voice maybe as much or more than we want to hear anybody else's voice. And so for us to be silent, it's not easy. It's hard. So what does it say about us when we always have to have the TV on, we always have to have the radio on, we always have to have noise and music? What does that say about us? Is it we're trying to run from something? Is we're trying to avoid the silence? Are we trying to avoid hearing God's voice? Just a question. We've got the external noise and we've got the internal noise. And our minds are rolling and thinking, you know, fantasies or revenge or anxiety or worry or taxes coming up or the politics or squirrel or, you know, whatever it is, it's always going through our mind, right? You know how that works? I remember uh, taking seminary classes now. This will date me too a little bit. My seminary was in Southern California and I lived in Kansas City. And so these apologetics classes I was taking required me to listen to the lectures because I couldn't travel there. Listen to the lectures and, and this is for any young people to hear on a cassette tape. Now these things, these things were remarkable because you had high fidelity stereo sound that you could hear in your cassette tapes. But these cassette tapes, you know, I had to buy them and listen to the lectures. And, you know, imagine yourself putting in a cassette tape in a cassette tape player and listening to a, a, a seminary lecture on apologetics and the philosophy of, you know, Christian thought or whatever it was. And I remember listening the first time and my mind is way off over here and I go, oh, I got to rewind this. I'm not listening to this at all. And it was really a challenge. It, was a, it really was difficult to listen to this, but, but I had to take notes and, and I would record my notes that I would take from the lecture and write the papers and I would record them on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk because we were high tech. Mail that off and get that, get the, the professor would, would dialogue over the phone with me and ask some questions Socratically and it was lots of fun. But, but that was a challenging discipline for me. I couldn't do, at first, I couldn't do anything else because I had to concentrate on this stupid cassette tape player and listen to it. But of course, the more that I got into it, then I could... I could listen and, and do some other things, certainly take my notes, and I could be, you know, maybe doing some laundry or something and, and writing down some notes or whatever it was. But it takes a discipline to hear God's voice for us, to, to be sensitive to hear what he's saying. But that is fostered in a, in a place of solitude in the Eremos so that we can hear God's voice. Drury writes about solitude. He says, solitude is abstaining from contact with people in order to be alone with God and to grow closer to Him. Solitude reminds us of the order that we should maintain our relationships. God first, others second. A Christian who does not practice solitude is likely to be over-reliant on friends and under-reliant on God. Solitude corrects this imbalance. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. Remain in me. And you'll bear much fruit. Now we see this world that we live in filled with anxiety, filled with conflict. There's no peace. We see so many people in the church, though, who call themselves followers of Jesus, who call themselves disciples of Jesus, and yet they don't have joy, and they don't have peace, and they don't have contentment. Is there a connection between our lack of silence and solitude and hearing from God and being with God and the anxiety and the lack of contentment that we have? Without solitude, 
Henry Nouwen writes, it's virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and to listen to Him. So we want to be holy. We want to be like Jesus, right? We want to bear the fruit of Jesus. We want to serve Jesus. But if we don't stop and take time to be with Jesus, to be with God, and to listen to Him, and just just be with Him, if we don't take that time, we'll never be effective at the life of Christ that we want to live. Without me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. Remain in me. Cal Newport writes, We need to wean our mind from a dependence on distraction. And the world is vying for our attention. They're working hard to grab our attention. And every form of media, and every form, they want to grab our attention. But Psalm 46 verse 10 Let's read this together. Be still and know that I am God. We know that verse. We've heard that verse. Those who've been around the church, we've heard it a lot of times. Be still and know that I'm God. If we want the life of Jesus, we need to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So what are our next steps? How do we put this into practice In a world that's working so hard to gather our attention, we've got to be intentional. This doesn't happen by accident. We've got to focus ourselves in the practices of Jesus. And this is very clearly, as you read through the Gospels, this is very clearly a practice of Jesus. So the first thing is what we talked about last week. We need to marinate, we need to saturate ourselves in in the life of Jesus as we read through the Gospels. So let me encourage you to read through the Gospels. If you read through them in Dutch, if you read them in Spanish, if you read them in English, read the Gospels. Read the Gospels. Let yourself get soaked in and see the life of Jesus. And, and I know some of you can say, well, I can sit and read five chapters a day, and, and, and that would be tempting to do that. But just take a smaller portion. Just take one chapter a day, and just let that chapter, read it slowly, and just let it soak in. Let it, let it just pour over you, and you might see some things that you, you've never seen before, or, or the Spirit might speak to you through the Word in a way that you've never seen before. So as we take the time to read the Gospels, let me, let me challenge you to go to the Aramos as well. Now, I've got a portable Aramos at our house, at the Parsonage. We've got two levels at the Parsonage, and down in the lower level is a reclining chair that's mine. <laughs> Stephanie bought the couch and she bought the love seat, but the recliner is mine. It really is. <laughs> I let her set in it on occasion, but not very often. That's my place where I just go and get away. I'm not here in the office. I'm not here with the phone and everything that's going on. I'm in the couch. And sometimes God speaks and it's, it's really clear. And sometimes it's, it's 10, 15 minutes of silence and quiet and nothing. Did God say anything to you today? No, not necessarily, but I spent time with him. And you know what's what's interesting? um, We we talked about this a little bit like with um, our dog that we put down in November. You know, when you'd come to the house and if Stephanie was gone, the house wasn't alone, the dog would be there. And so you'd be there with the dog, even though the dog can't talk, you'd be there with the dog. And, and there's something about the, the presence of another living being. And you can experience that with God as well. That, that when you just quiet yourself down, it, it's amazing how you recognize the presence of God can be right there with you. And what joy it is. And then pretty soon my phone starts to buzz and everything starts to happen. And oh, I need to get up and I need to get going. I got stuff to do today. But I... Try to get myself some time. And so we don't need to be monks at the first. We don't need to spend three hours a day in silence and solitude. But, but let me challenge you. Start with maybe 10 minutes. Try 10 minutes. Do something small. 
And the first time you do it, if you're not, if, you, if this isn't one of your regular practices, the first time you do it, you're going to be thinking, oh, I just hear the clock ticking, I hear everything going on, the traffic, and, and it, it, I just got nothing out of it. But you're going to have to keep going back to it, keep working at it. And I think you'll find it rewarding to be still and know that I am God. I want to close by, by having us read together Philippians 4. May we could stand together as we do just that. Philippians chapter 4, the, the passage that we read earlier. In the world that, that is so busy, so consumed, the, this kingdom of noise that we live in. Let me encourage you to, to take on the lifestyle of Jesus. Let's read it together. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises of your word. We pray that we might experience your presence in a fresh, a new way. God, we're not content to remain where we are. We want to move forward. We want to grow in our faith. We want to grow in Christ's likeness. We want to grow in our holiness. Father, help us to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus and to carve out and make time to be with you. We know that you love us. We know that you want what's best for us. Go with us now as we leave this place. Help us to walk by the Spirit, live in the Spirit, abide in Christ, remain in Christ. And may the joy and the peace and the contentment of Christ overflow and spill out of our lives and onto a hurting and lost world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. She disappeared. Everybody's looking up there like, oh. <laughs> Where did he go? He's the one that was there. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Hello, good to see you guys. Hey, how are you doing?